Welcome back to A Lovely Jaunt, where we read better, not more. My name is Alexandra, and as promised, I'm not making these videos unless I have something to say, which I have something to say, so here I am. Today we're going to be talking about The Road by Cormac McCarthy. I finished reading it about a month ago, and I shared a few thoughts over my TikTok, but as I've sat with it more, I have um, basically longer thoughts to put together into a video for you on this book and how to analyze it. As always, spoilers abound. I will be doing, you know, a deep dive into what happens in this book and what it means. So to do that, I have to talk about the details of what happens in this book. So let's start with a summary of what happens in The Road. It's really not a complex story, and I really enjoyed reading it. I should say that up top. I think I disagree with some of the elements that are presented as like, this is how the world works. We'll get into that. But I really enjoyed reading it. I thought it was very well written. I also think it's quite accessible. I read it probably less than 24 hours. I read it across two days. You know, it just took a few hours of reading. It's a simple, you know, narrative style that is really common in sort of American, the tradition of American literature. And I think a lot of people can read it and enjoy it because like there's not a lot of complex language you know, or flowery language or that sort of thing. It's a little bit brunt, blunt and brutal and straightforward in its stylistic choices. We have two main characters, the man and the boy, and they're heavily implied to be father and son, but they're never actually called father and son in the book. And I think that is really significant because the book is also talking a lot about individualism. So even at the level of, you know, the identity of these characters and the relationships that we have to, that, to each other, that's really downplayed in the very language and the choices that this story makes. The narrative point of view is primarily from the man's perspective until the very end, which he dies. Again, like I said, there's going to be spoilers in this video. So he dies and then we get a little bit more narrative of what happens to the boy after the man passes away that's sort of just in this more third person omniscient. Throughout the narrative, the man also shares memories of his wife. So his wife is this character who also exists, but only in his memories. She doesn't exist. She's already passed away by the time the narrative timeline of this story starts. And we know that she gives birth to the boy. So she's like a wife or partner. And at some point afterward, having considered the landscape of this world sort of post-collapse, post-apocalypse, she mindfully opts out if you will. So the man and the boy are traveling on the road through a world that is post-collapse and the nature of the collapse is not revealed. You know, that's not really important to the narrative, but instead we see them trying to basically scavenge off of the remnants of what was, what appears to be kind of like our type of America, like modern day America. Eventually they make it to the sea where a naval ship is abandoned and run aground on the beach and they're able to get quite a few supplies from this find. From page one of the story, the man has been coughing up blood so we know that he's sick and unwell and he is eventually going to die and that is indeed what happens by the end of the story as a result of whatever sickness he has. Let's talk about the two different worldviews that are presented by these two different characters. The man and the boy have two different ways of kind of assessing risk and seeing what types of risk that they're comfortable with. The man is extremely cautious of people but is very willing to take risks with regard to entering abandoned buildings or homes or businesses to try to find food and supplies. And the boy is much more cautious about this. He's frequently very uncomfortable with his dad leaving him, with the man leaving him, and with the potential risk that that might incur. By contrast, he really longs for connections. So there's times where he sees, you know, a dog on the side of the road and he wants to adopt the dog. He sees a young boy who's about his age on the side of the road and he wants to go make friends with him. He sees an old man on the side of the road and he actually, in that case, convinces his dad to share some of their supplies with the man and they share their fire for one evening and then kind of send him on his way. So he wants to build connection with others and he's willing to take risks in form of you know, trying to trust people and trying to form relationships. 
Now, from the man's perspective, you could say, well, the only reason why the boy is able to risk connecting with others is because the man has taken the risk to find the supplies in the first place, which is what he offers as a first form of friendship with these people. But from the boy's perspective, you could say, well, if you have 30 days of supplies and you're going to die inevitably when you run out, if you give one away, like what's the difference between living 29 days and 30 days? And also at some point, like, we have to move on from trying to survive on the carcass of an old society and you have to try to build a new society, which means you have to risk trusting others at some point. And I think there's something to be said for saying to yourself, you know, these post-apocalyptic narratives um, or narratives that deal with these extreme situations that put a lot of pressure on the morals of a human being, you kind of have to say to yourself at some point, where do I draw the line between what I'm willing to do and where do I draw the line around like I'm going to start manifesting and embodying the world in which I want to live in. So kind of fundamentally, I think three post-apocalyptic philosophies are represented here. From the man, it's sort of like, what are you willing to do in order to survive and protect your loved ones in the most extreme circumstances? What part of your humanity are you willing to sacrifice? Because of course, the struggle to protect and defend himself against violent and chaotic people comes at the cost of him being willing to you know, kill people at different times or harm people at different times. And that's hard on his soul and it's really hard for the boy to watch. So what kind of sacrifice of your, basically your humanity or your morals are you willing to give in this equation of survival? On the boy's side, it's sort of like, what are you willing to sacrifice even up to your own safety and life in order create, to create the world in which you want to live? And so it's like the sacrifice of your life is what's on the table in order to manifest this either for yourself or future generations. And in the case of the woman or the wife or the life partner of the man, the mother of the boy, she's basically saying, I'm neither willing to sacrifice to protect nor sacrifice to build a new world, but instead I choose to opt out, which, you know, fair enough. I think the burdens of what it would require for women either to protect or survive or even to build a new society is often on like, you know, sex on the part of women. So, you know, those sacrifices could look quite different depending on the gender and that sort of thing. So now I want to kind of address the overall pessimism that's exhibited in the story. So the Rhodes vision of human nature is in context of this pessimistic world. And I find that a lot of people make this mistake, or at least I think it's a mistake. I think this is untrue, which is that, you know, no one mis makes the mistake of thinking that optimism is realism. Like we perceive it as being quite naive and rainbows and butterflies and unicorns and blah, blah, blah. If, if wishes were horses and all that sort of thing, it's quite easy for us to see the ways in which having an optimistic worldview is not realistic. But I think in our society, either because we're jaded or whatever, it, it's really quite easy to conflate uh, pessimism with realism, which I also think is false. I would say, here's my hot take of the video. It is equally naive to live in service of a pessimistic worldview as it is to live in service of an optimistic worldview. I, and I think it is the sort of thing that's like depicted in these types of story is like an absurd fantasy that comes from toxic masculinity that envisions a world where, you know, humanity is really hanging on by the thread of like social niceties that if we didn't have this complex social structure, you know, we would all be likely to fall into just being like chaotic monsters who would like, you know, just serve our basest desires. Men, as a result, will be called upon to make a sacrifice that they always must make, that those who are too soft, soft like can't understand. This is very much a you can't handle the truth kind of moment, um, which is to sacrifice their own humanity, their own dignity, and their own morality. And I think, you know, this comes from a sort of internalized self-hatred that sort of becomes justified in these circumstances that you get to step into this role of violence, but it's like justified violence, right? And so rather than meeting the challenge of becoming a better person um, and being willing to become intimate with other people, 
which I think goes back to the narrative choice to refer to the man and the uh, boy as man and boy, not father, son, real resistance to intimacy and to community and connection is part of the fantasy of their circumstances that would justify this moral bankruptcy. They manifest the circumstances which would allow them to continue to idolize their own suffering in these contexts rather than choose to heal from their suffering and connect with others. I also think that like the minute our social fabric kind of falls apart, this idea that we're sort of like bound to act out like br in the brutality of like the Lord of the Flies or whatever, that we revert not even to a level of like pragmatic violence or one of cautious self-protection, which is what the man exhibits, but that you know, basically everyone on the planet will revert to a level of like exploitative violence, either setting violent traps or cannibalism is a big theme in this book as well. And this theme comes out a lot in disaster movies or zombie movies or whatever. And that there are characters who thrive in that chaos that allows for this sort of opportunistic cruelty and violence. And there's also like this idea that they will succeed in keeping the world in this state through their chaotic choices. But what does the road say on the side of optimism? When the boy reaches out to trust others, what happens? Well, the old man on the side of the road is really the only one that he's allowed to do successfully because his father's always kind of reigning in that tendency of the boy. And the boy successfully shares his food and the old man does not take advantage of him. But, you know, quite quickly, the man kind of runs him off and they don't have a sustained relationship. So we're not really able to see the ultimate conclusion of what that relationship has the potential to hold. At the end of the book, we also get a scene where we sh are shown how the boy is adopted into a new family that is complete with a father, a mother, a boy, a girl, and a dog. Now, I think there's more than one way to interpret that final scene. We can take it at face value and say like, oh, the boy has truly had this experience, in which case we're left with the ending on an optimistic note, that the boy is in fact able to forge meaningful relationships into a family unit and that procures his safety for the long term after his father has passed away. The other way that we can interpret this is that the boy is actually having a dream, which is a little bit of a cheesy interpretation. You know, we've got like Wizard of Oz vibes or whatever, but here's the reason why I think that's a viable interpretation. One, because the boy has been languishing at, by the side of his father's corpse for three days without any supplies. The other thing is that we have a repeated dialogue throughout the story that, and whenever you see a repeated dialogue or language that's repeated, that means it's really important to the narrative. It means that it's really important to the author. They want us to pay attention to this. And the often in the context of the man taking a physical risk to go into a building, um, sometimes he's successful, sometimes he's not, to find supplies, the boy after that will say, oh, I'm having nightmares. And the way that the father comforts his son is by saying, you know, that's okay for you to have bad dreams, which is basically saying like, hey, you're in tough circumstances, being afraid is okay. It's completely reasonable for you to feel fear in these tough circumstances. And then he says, you got to watch out when you have a good dream. That's when you know that like it's the end for you. Basically, he's saying that's when he know you know that you're either close to death or you've passed away or whatever. Uh, in the words of uh, Gladiator, you know, if you feel the sun on your face in a soft breeze, that means that you're in Elysium and you're already dead, right? That's basically the message here. It's like if you have a good dream, that's because you're done so, right? And because the scene has happened so many times, and then we see this basically savior figure appears on the third day after he's doing this. And the imagery is, is that he's, so again, Christ type, right? We have this third day resurrection. The imagery is that he's carrying a gun, but not using it, which is very much in line with this Christ type of being both the lion and the lamb. He's letting the boy keep his own gun. So that's a dispensation of authority. This is classic Genesis stuff. And then he invites him to be part of his family. Again, a manifestation of sort of like this Christian narrative that you can be adopted into the family of God. So do we see this good dream as the boy dying or do we again take it, take it as, or the dream is some sort of internalized, um, about the internalized religious structures that give us hope in dark circumstances, but they're ultimately false. Like, how do we kind of see this particular figure in the context of the work as a whole? Now, 
I lean towards the dream interpretation. One, because it seems out of character for McCarthy. I haven't read any of his other books, but I know that he tends to have quite a dark and pessimistic worldview as exhibited in The Road. So I think it's more in line with what I understand the rest of McCarthy's works to lean towards. And I also think even within the context of The Road, to have like this pretty brutal book and then at the end be like, but he turned out okay and he found the perfect family even with a puppy dog and a picket fence. Like it just doesn't seem to cohere with the rest of the book. It seems quite out of character. I don't think it's a slam dunk, however. I think you could see this as like a final statement that the boy was wrong and, or that the man was wrong and the boy is right. Because again, there are scenes leading up to this that indicate that the boy has this longing and he's attempting to connect with others. And so you do have breadcrumbs leading up to this that you could say like, oh, well, this is the ultimate fulfillment of like the boy's worldview and that like the world is turning around and now it is a time for connection and the chaos is coming to an end. But again, I think, I think that's a little bit harder to justify in the context of the road. I think it's a little bit of a weaker interpretation. And I also think like in the broader context of McCarthy's work, it it's, uh, seems to be out of character. Now, as I've already indicated, I disagree with the pessimism and individualism as it's represented in this book. And it helped me to refine a couple of personal views. You know, I don't often actually talk about what I think in these videos. I'm usually doing my best to kind of interpret what I see in the books. And, you know, again, I could be wrong. It's my opinion about what I think the books mean, but I'm not often showing you my personal worldview of what I think is right or wrong. But we're going to do it today. Hand in hand with the pessimism of the novel is, you know, very much this rugged individualism that we see in American culture. The man in particular manifests this. The man is unwilling to connect with others, blah, blah, blah. I've already talked about this. One of the reasons that this rings false to me is what I've already stated about pessimism. And I feel like it comes from a fantasy that it finds its origins in toxic masculinity where you're like, I have heard of these camps that are quite expensive that men can pay to go to like out in the wilderness where it duplicates basic training in the army. So you get like yelled at and you know, you're made to be very tough. But like to do that without like the necessity of war or just as, as a way to sort of like manifest your masculinity and say that you are tough, it seems there's a difference. Okay, here's what I'll say. There's a difference between being willing to face the difficult circumstances of life when they call upon you, because we all face suffering in this world, because their life is difficult. And if you haven't faced it yet, don't worry, you'll it'll come, you know? And so there's a difference between being willing to face up to the harsh realities of life and, and inviting in suffering that is completely unnecessary and is part of like, you know, basically LARPing masculinity or something. I think this goes down to, I mean, we're really, our culture is really, really hard on men in this regard, which is that like, again, men see themselves as bearing suffering in order to justify their existence. And if they're not suffering enough, then do you have to like go out to seek more suffering in order to soothe their conscience, which is like uncomfortable without a level of suffering in their lives. And I think this comes down to basically our society telling men that they don't have an intrinsic right to exist. Like either you have to be producing, you have to be productive, you have to be making money, or you have to be defending your family. And that comes with danger and like you have to have something to defend against. So you have to have like dangerous circumstances. And that comes with, again, the suffering, the sacrifice of your humanity in order to like complete that role that society has set out for you. I, and obviously I disagree with that. Like everybody has the intrinsic right to existence, the intrinsic right to be that is not conditional upon your usefulness to society or your usefulness to your family. I do not believe in an instrumental value of human life. And so this internalized belief that manifests, I think, in these toxic ways. At the same time, there's sort of like this inherent contradiction, like the individualism, right? So the man must push forward alone. He must alone protect the boy and survive for the boy. Yet the process of basic training is also one of like, it destroys your ego and it helps you to become part of the collective, right? And so this type of thinking where you must sort of seek out the circumstances of suffering to justify a male existence and or 
to justify violence and even the dismantling of your own ego through like your dismantling your dignity and morality is also one which like destroys healthy self-actualization which is what leads to true autonomy and it does so with this insistence on rugged individualism so there's like an inherent contradiction there that i think is silly so let's talk about like my perspective is that it's actually much more healthy to self-actualize in the context of community and we see this at the sort of like fundamentals of what we understand about psychological development even from like infancy which is that a baby comes to realize that they are not like they and their mother have separate identities through them obviously brain development but then like them growing and realizing that like in community i am not you and you are not me and it happens in that first essential caretaker role healthy self-actualization comes in developing the self not in destroying it and in manifesting the world that you want to live in by embodying it not by sacrificing your dignity and morality now the reason why in the context of this novel it rings true that like the dad has to sacrifice his dignity and morality is because I think the novel presents an overly pessimistic worldview of like how humans behave and what would happen if society collapsed. So now we get to kind of like the kernel of the lie in the road and it is this denial that human beings won't coalesce back into community. Like human beings for all of history as far as we know i mean like i'll just take western history because obviously that's what i'm most familiar with but you could take whatever any continent on which humans have existed for a millennia and say like okay so <laughs> like the mesopotamians collapse babylonians collapse egyptians collapse greeks collapse romans collapse like all of these societies have gone through periods of collapse and yet always humans have gathered together into little groups and little tribes and little family units and groups of people that they can trust and built society coalescing into larger and complex groups. So never once in all of human history when a society has collapsed has it maintained sustained chaos and violence after that. It has always reorganized itself into community and society. This lie that you know, violence and chaos will reign at the, as a result of human collapse is the only way to justify the type of sacrifice that the man stands for. It is the only way that his like need to compromise his morality, compromise his dignity, compromise humanity as a sacrifice for protecting his son. That's the only way to justify it is if that is true, but I don't think it's true. I think it's a lie. And so then anyway, I'm now repeating myself. Now, I do want to recognize that we live in a dark world and there are people who are evil and there are dark things out there. So again, an optimistic worldview is equally as naive. And <clears throat> again, pure, sustained, you know, optimism and hope and progress is also not realistic as a worldview on humanity, right? That's a lie too. There are obviously people in this world who are violent and cruel and chaotic, but like, first of all, there are very few true psychopaths in this world. It's extremely rare. So that's like a very, very minuscule part of our human nature and human population. And then we can also take a look at like violence as a product of its circumstances. So again, humans do manifest violence, not as a result purely of psychopathy, but often as a result of like, their circumstances. So for example, if you like go to prison and you have, you know, a certain way of life there that's extremely violent, then you adapt to those circumstances. And when you come out of prison, you have to readapt to society that is less violent. And this is the type of violence that expo this is explored in The Road, like the type of violence that you have to reckon with that you don't choose and seek out in the way that a psychopath would, but the type of violence that you have to reckon with in extreme circumstances, right? 
But there's another type of evil that manifests that the road it has not reckoned with and can't given the structure of the book. So this isn't really like a criticism of the book. This is just an observation on how it has helped me refine my worldview, which is that there's a certain type of evil that actually thrives in social structure, especially the more complex and hierarchical it is. And that's the predator because they can hide in the levels of authority that exist and derive protection from the stability of society. Now that sort of person, the predator, who is, who, you know, is able to take advantage of the structures of society, that sort of person would like not be very good at surviving in a post-apocalyptic world where, you know, you have to be quite trustworthy. They would be, you know, shunned and set out because these groups are very flat hierarchically in small communities, it's like, no, you would not be able to like get away with what you want to get away with for very long in those types of situations. Okay, so that's the end of me kind of talking about my worldview and some of the ideas that like I kind of concretized as a result of reading this book. Let's go back to a discussion on the meaning of the work as a whole. So let's ask a few questions of the text, which is like, what is this book advocating? Is it saying that the man's worldview is uh, correct but tragic? That we are faced with a world that is red in tooth and claw and all we can do is fight to defend what is ours, exclude everyone else from that circle of defense and protection and try to survive. And the tragedy is that we all die in the end anyway and that which we fought to protect uh, is laid vulnerable to this violent and chaotic world. Is it saying that the woman's worldview is correct? That to face the inevitable tragedy that is manifest in the man's worldview is to look that to look that into the face, look that in the face like with real realism and to really understand what you're facing is to determine that the best option is to opt out. It's nihilism, right? Or do we see that the boy is right? Do we see the ending as real and not a dream? Do we see that the risk involved in reaching out to others is the appropriate risk to take in the hopes of building a community and, and, and making the world better for the future? Another possible interpretation, and I'm like really not sure if McCarthy intended this or not, is actually criticizing the kind of toxic masculinity that sits underneath this pessimism and individualism and informs the worldview of this novel. That like, while we recognize that chaos and evil exists in this world, to adopt a path of individualism and violence is to perpetuate the modus operandi. And perhaps the modus operandi is ultimately inescapable, but it's up to our free will to go with the grain or against the grain. Like you still have a choice of how you're going to interact with the world as it exists. And I don't know, <laughs> and I don't think it's possible to know on that last one, because it seems to me that it is manifestly awful to observe the world as birthing only violence, evil, and chaos, and to say that, oh, it's our role to adapt to it and not to resist it. That's like a tough pill for me to swallow, but maybe that's what makes McCarthy McCarthy, and maybe that's ultimately why I disagree with him. So in conclusion, we covered a lot of ground here, and I think I want to outline sort of three main points that I hope you will walk away with from this video. One, I hope that you'll agree with me that adopting a worldview of pessimism is not realistic, and it is a fantasy to the same degree that adopting a worldview of pure optimism is not realistic and a fantasy and naive. And I think that the ending of the novel is open to interpretation, but I do think that the dream interpretation is stronger. And I want to know what you think the ultimate meaning of this work is. Is it that the woman's worldview is correct, which is basically nihilism? Is it that the man's worldview is correct, which is basically pragmatism? Or is it that the boy's worldview is correct, which is like, it's our role to attempt to manifest the type of world that we want to live in? Or is it the final world one that I talked about, which is that McCarthy is criticizing the man's pragmatism, which leads to further instantiation of chaos and violence because he's going with the grain of society. 
So yeah, <laughs> so that's all I've got for you today. I would love to know of those four kind of ultimate interpretations, which one you think. Let me know what you think about The Road and McCarthy and for other people who have read more of him than I have, I'd love to know your opinion as well. Am I kind of on the right track with McCarthy and his pessimism? Is it possible that he's actually criticizing this worldview? I'd love to know your thoughts. And until next time, my name is Alexandra and I'm still a bibliophile. Mm -hmm.